in, the, in this uh, talk, I, I'm going to try to walk you quickly through uh, all the methods uh, of computer vision. Somehow, um, if, you, if you need to understand, uh, if you need to work with data, the first thing you need is to understand what kind of a solution you're looking for. And, and these have different names. Uh, and uh, hopefully at the end of this uh, talk, if I tell you how do we do that and describe a real world problem to you, you could tell me, oh, you know what? This is this kind of problem. It's solved by this kind of solutions. Um, so in the past until uh, roughly 10 years ago, computer vision was mostly uh, uh, methods that are now extinct. Uh, somehow it, it, it was uh, about calculating things uh, in a deterministic manner, uh, having some kind of algorithm and eventually having a, a bit of da data-driven stuff. Uh, now it's mostly deep learning, which is the new paradigm, is what people talk about in the public as AI. Uh, and it means that it's uh, more or less done by neural networks uh, operating on images. Uh, so, so a bit to know to, uh, the things, the first thing, the first concept we should be familiar with is knowledge transfer. And knowledge transfer uh, is, uh, is more or less because uh, labeled data, which is how we train neural networks, Neural networks are notorious on how much annotated data they need to be trained. Um, labeled uh, data are very rare, right? Uh, tuning and training is very sensitive. Uh, so somehow, quite often, we're better off just repurposing something that has already been trained for something similar. Uh, and uh, in a typical supervised learning workflow, and supervised learning is more or less the, the standard way of doing it. There's other ways, but they're somehow way harder uh, to use. So in supervised data learning uh, workflow, we have more or less that we split the data into a work uh, and a test set, a train and a test set, right? And then we do some things and at the end we're winners. Right? And the question is, what goes in between? Right? So the in between has many steps. Uh, we, we should uh, maybe split our trained data into pure trained data and validation data if we want to make informed decisions after the fact. We should pre-process our data. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Normalizing colors might be a very simple example. Um, and then we want to train a statistical model, uh, a deep learning model, uh, on the work data that we could find. And then we want to apply that model both to the test set, but probably in the case of, uh, of uh, distant uh, seeing, uh, also to data that is not annotated. Right? In the end, the byproduct for, for what we're doing is uh, how we perform on the data that has not been annotated, right? Uh, annotating data is expensive. We will never have big corpora annotated uh, manually. So, so the, the, the standard uh, neural network for images, and one thing that is quite interesting is that essentially image neural networks were the ones that paved the road for language neural networks, right? They, they precede language neural networks, although they seem to be operating on more complicated data. Um, so a, a, an image is propagated through a sequence of convolutional layers, right? As we can see, uh, uh, an image goes through layers. Uh, in, in this drawing here, right, uh, one thing that is important to, when, when understanding uh, this, uh, this graphic, one thing that is a bit important to keep in mind is that these rectangles here, they refer to intermediary representations of the image, right? So the, so the idea is that 
more or less. This is the first image and then we process it, we express it in different ways. And as we go deeper, we have more and more ways to express the image. Uh, but somehow, as we have more ways and we're more informed about what's happening, usually we don't need to be so precise on where things happen. Right? Uh, so, so somehow the, the way we can do a drastic uh, reduction of the size, and that's practically to make the whole thing tractable computationally, Right. What we actually need is to widen this, this dimension. What we practically need is to be able to talk about more things in an image, uh, or more things occurring inside an image as we go deeper. But in order to be able to keep that tractable, we also don't sample. And we do that with pooling, right? So, um, so as we said, until this stage here, we have cascades of convolutions, which means aggregating local information, uh, and then pooling, and that happens whenever we see this drastic reduction in the size. Uh, and still here we have the notion of pixels, right? Here it might be something like seven by seven pixels, but still we have a notion of geometry, where things occur in an image, and Eventually, we talk holistically about the image. When we arrive here, there's one by one pixel, and at that moment, we're no longer reasoning about where things occur. We're simply reasoning about what occurred. Okay, so for example, uh, we might have something like, here we detect corners and edges, and here maybe we detect eyes. Here we might be detecting faces. Here we might be detecting people, right? And eventually, when we arrive here, uh, we might be saying, oh, is there a dog? Is there a human in the picture? Right? How much have I seen humans in this picture? How much have I seen dogs? How much have I seen grass? Therefore, it must be someone in the park. And somehow, I could have an opinion that this is an image, if we're classifying, let's say, recreational activities, that this is someone in the park. Uh, that, that's a bit how this kind of reasoning works, right? So somehow, uh, as we go deeper, we become more um, informed. So how does this training work? The, the fundamental thing in supervised learning is what we call back error propagation. Uh, depending on the country, uh, some people might have done this in high school, some others might have not, but that's a bit the limit uh, of, of, of of competence just to understand the math behind this, right? So we, 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 try to, uh, we try to compute the responsibility of every specific neuron in our neural network for the error that occurred, right? So if we look a bit into this network, what happens is that we put it here. This predicted that we were looking at an image of someone uh, going for a walk in the park versus going for sports uh, or looking uh, at a stadium observing sports. And it, let's assume that it was something like 80% wrong, right? It goes back and, and it decides on each neuron how much they contributed to that mistake. Eventually, when it arrives here, it begins to spread out that to pixels. And so every element computing pixels was independently blamed for each, uh, for, for how much it contributed to the mistake. That's a bit how this works. But one thing we must keep in mind is that the whole notion of uh, convolutional layers is that one neuron will not talk only about one pixel. Every neuron inside here talks more or less about all pixels and their, and their relationship to their neighborhood. So somehow, the error is, uh, let's say, assigned independently, but it's also merged and accumulated. So somehow, one neuron could be wrong in 20 ways, right? All these are summed up. Uh, and that's a bit how back error propagation works. But in order to assign blame, we need it to be differentiable, right? Uh, I guess 
uh, at your level, what would be the, let's say, the maximum you should ever know about this would be to develop a bit of intuition on what is differentiable, what not, and, and understand that not every, not everything, not every error measurement can be used uh, in order to train data. The fact that uh, we always start with the notion of choosing uh, in, order to in order to talk a bit about deep learning is that choice happens to have the best behaving method in order to produce these meaningful errors, right? Somehow errors that can assign independent blame. Uh, and uh, and if we want to look at it from a, a more uh, technical point of view, right? Um, what we're actually trying to get is that we're trying to get the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters of the model. Uh, and we talked a bit about this notion of calculus and differentiability. Uh, so if we think a bit abstractly, uh, about, uh, about that. If we only had a neural network with two neurons, right? Modern day n networks have millions, right? If we only had a, a network with uh, two neurons, right? What we could say roughly is, let's put here values that our first neuron takes and values that our second neuron takes, right? And we would have a, a plane, a height map on how well is our model behaving on the whole data set, right? And, and we would like to, 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 to make this a map of errors. Right? That's a bit, uh, it could be the other way around, but the standard conversion is that we're talking about errors and we want to minimize them. We could be talking about correctness and maximizing. It would be exactly the same thing, okay? But we, the standard math LIGO is that we want to take a mathematical description of the error and make it zero. Uh, and the question is, how should we change the neurons to make that zero? And essentially, one way of seeing that is that we're, if we assume that there is such a thing, right, we want to explore this error surface in order to find the, the global minimum. Right? We could have here a bump. Right? Think of it as a mountain. When I was first told this analogy, this didn't make sense to me. I, I said, if we're here when we randomly initialize our network, why don't we just jump there? Are we masochists? What's the point? So I think that the best way to get a, a proper intuition of the complexity of the problem is that we're lost in a mountain, but there's fog. We can only see at our feet the slope. We cannot see it totally, right? So the, the question is, how can we train? How can we, on what direction should, should we move so that we can f go to the low, to the bottom, go, to the bottom of our, our error grade, while we can only see locally what's happening, right? So when we're here, we have an opinion of the local slope. And when we're here, that uh, shifts, and then it shifts, and then it shifts. So, so somehow, in this analogy, this means that we more or less did four jumps to arrive here. Um, so, uh, there are hardware considerations to this, right? Because this example we showed there is two dimensions and going down a slope on a two dimension thing with fog is kind of doable, although it, it can be quite hard. Uh, but when we're talking about millions of different directions, every step, that's a one more version of the curse of dimensionality. We can take extremely more possible directions and all directions will be somehow appearing better than if you only had two of them. So, so that's a bit our problem. And that's a, a different way of thinking of the curse of dimensionality, right? Uh, but, but, uh, but, but there are uh, a, a few things, right? So the, the, the number of parameters a, a model has uh, on, on linear layers, or uh, what we would call the, the original neural network layers, more or less these ones here, right? Uh, so when we go from this representation 
of, of a sample to this one, if this has 4,000 numbers and this has 4,000 numbers, we have uh, 16 million numbers, right? Because more or less we want to indicate the relationship of everything to everything. So when we're talking about these layers here that do, let's say, the high level, the abstract reasoning, uh, the way in which things are connected is extremely more complicated. Uh, while when we're dealing with, the, let's say, more primitive things like, oh, finding an eye, finding a, a nail, or I don't know what we're looking for, uh, then it's a bit of a different problem altogether. Because in that case, what's really expensive and big is our data. So on the fully connected layer, right, we had uh, 16 million parameters and 4,000 activations, right? So representing a, da a single sample just needs 4,000 numbers. While in the very first layer, uh, we have uh, something like a million numbers, roughly, right? A bit less than a million. Uh, but our convolutional kernels, because they just say how should things relate to their immediate neighbors? I don't remember now exactly, but they should be around uh, one or 200 numbers, right? So somehow uh, the distinction between parameters of a model uh, and activation size, that's a fundamental one you must make. It has to do with very much with what you can train and what you cannot. It has to do with uh, how to fit things in your hardware, whatever it is. If, if these two things are conflated in your, in your head, it's very hard to, to just decide what, how much money you should spend on a GPU. Uh, and, uh, and the answer of the better, the more the better, uh, might have made sense when we had PCs where the most expensive GPU was 2000, but now with cloud solutions, that could literally mean millions of dollars. So, so, so somehow, uh, understanding this trade-off is really important uh, and being able to, to see such a thing and understanding what, what is going to be expensive here uh, is a bit of thing that if you end out training those things you, you need quite a bit. The, the other thing about these typical deep learning models right, is that Training them, uh, while the, the number of parameters of a model, which is how many numbers describe uh, the knowledge we're acquiring, uh, is the same whether you're training or just using a neural network. When, when, when you're training, the number of uh, memory, the, the size of memory you need uh, is, uh, is quite bigger. Uh, and the, the reason is that in order to have backpropagation work, right, we compute the, the forward pass, right? So we pass this image through here, and then we will create all these numbers here, and then we will create all these numbers here. If we're just using the network, if it's already trained, one by one we use it and discard it. But if we want to train it, we want to keep everything in between in memory, so that we can come back and assign blame. Uh, and because of that, uh, we might, depending on what we're dealing with, we might need something like a hundred times bigger machine to train than to test. Or not. It depends on this trade-off of what is an activation and what is a parameter. Uh, this is uh, exactly the same whether we're dealing with images or language. Uh, so, roughly, the, the, the rule of thumb when we're thinking a bit about hardware and where can we train these things is that activations, when training, they must be cached in memory for the whole uh, cycle to the front. Uh, and somehow they are proportional to flops, to how, how many additions and multiplications we're doing, right? Flops stands for uh, floating uh, operations per second. It's somehow how much we're counting. And, uh, and when we have big activations, right, um, 
we, we need a lot of energy. For, for, for weights, uh, it's more or less the size of... A, a good way of understanding weights would be how big is it when we save it on the hard drive after we're done training. That's what the weights are. Uh, and uh, somehow is inherently related to what we call the model capacity. Uh, we would expect that in the same roughly shape, uh, a model that has more weights can learn more things. Now, whether we can successfully do it is a different question, but it could learn if under a perfect training regimen, it could learn more things. And all of this must fit in the GPU, right? And that's a bit our big constraint. Fitting the stuff into the GPU is usually the limit we, we meet when we're using uh, deep learning. So if we think a bit about image classification, as I said, that's uh, the standard uh, problem. It's where everything begins. It's the first thing that works spectacularly well with deep learning. And, and from one point of view, it's also the easiest to train. Uh, whenever you're thinking of, uh, of, uh, of a problem, if you can model it as such, it's probably your best chance of doing supervised learning. Right, so this is the typical MNIST data set, right? It's just the handwritten digits and we just want to predict for every image in here what is its class, that's it, right? So it's mapping more or less, this is 28 by 28 pixels. So from a purely mathematical perspective, what we're doing is that we want to map 768 numbers, which is all of that, uh, to a choice between 10 things. Right, so practically to a single integer. Uh, so, so the one thing that really drove uh, evolution of computer vision, uh, to a great extent paving way also for, for the NLP use of it, uh, was very well curated data sets. Very, very large, very labor intensive curation of data sets. Uh, with very, let's say, uh, objective methodologies as much uh, as possible, right? So in 2009, ImageNet uh, uh, happened and it was uh, a benchmark organized by Stanford, by the computer vision at, uh, lab at Stanford. Uh, and, uh, and all the industry leaders were, be, began competing. Uh, the idea was that we had small, uh, that our images were not, not, not very small, uh, but not big either, like 224 by 224 pixels. Uh, and they had to be uh, assigned to one or more uh, uh, categories that were derived from WordNet, right? So I'm not sure who's familiar with WordNet, but very briefly, WordNet is, uh, a, a, a language ontology uh, of, of nouns, if I'm not mistaken. In any case, uh, for, uh, for ImageNet, what they did is that they took uh, the most important or the most prominent noun and noun phrases they found uh, in WordNet, and they said, okay, each one of these is a class, and they, and they chose 22,000 of them, right? So somehow the idea was, this is a speedometer, because speedometer exists in those 22,000 numbers. Uh, and as we can see, right, uh, this is the error rate, uh, I think, on the, on the top one. Right? So somehow, uh, the benchmark, we then mapped the 20,000 classes to 1,000, just so that they're more balanced. Right? So we made meta classes. So somehow, if we think a bit of WordNet, it's a tree. Every, every word has a position in the tree. So what we did is that we chose to cut off words uh, so that they're somehow equally uh, important. Uh, there were a few other considerations. They chose to make a super fine-grained class. So I, I think they, they took 2,000 dog breeds so that we can see, for example, whether uh, systems can perform well in fine-grained classification. Uh, but roughly, the idea was associating a whole image holistically with a noun. And, 
And in 2011, that was more or less the, the state of the art, right? So somehow the best system would, would do that when choosing among a thousand nouns, what's best related to an image, it was getting something like, uh, I don't know, 72 uh, percent. It was correctly guessing 72 percent of the time. Uh, and as we would expect, there's a trend for this to go down. And, and, and here, right, uh, is the, the first full end-to-end -end neural network employed. So, so all this drop uh, was extremely spectacular, uh, reducing uh, the error by half on, on something where people are seriously competing to achieve is, is a major achievement. Uh, everyone was extremely surprised. Uh, and until this point, the, the dominant opinion uh, in academia and industry was that neural networks are just uh, an intellectual curiosity. They never work on big problems. We don't, we don't have, like, they have never worked. They only work on small toy examples like MNIST, and that's it. Uh, and suddenly, uh, it showed that this outperforms anything that many humans, uh, very highly skilled engineers, could put together making a complicated pipeline. Let's extract uh, shapes and then let's extract color and then let's blend them all together and somehow manually design uh, pipelines. Uh, and ever since this happened, everything else has been a, a deep neural network. Right? Uh, somehow, already here, uh, already here, no one else was even trying. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, at five percent is human performance, right? We have had done, we have done uh, usability studies. We know that humans will be wrong one out of twenty times if they're asked to manually classify among a thousand classes uh, an image, right? So somehow uh, it's obvious that we're talking about uh, superhuman performance, right? Indeed, that brings a few philosophical questions, right? Because the actual nouns are human inventions. Um, but somehow, uh, uh, if you have a crowd, each one is 5% individually wrong compared to the consensus, right? So somehow, there is such a notion of superhuman performance because uh, everyone is sometimes wrong. Uh, we can use uh, the broad consensus as the absolute truth, or maybe the informed opinion of some experts annotating it with a very specific guideline. Um, anyway, so, so every year in this there was a blind test, right? There were secret data that were not published to anyone, and people were submitting their systems. Uh, so they would more or less make executable file, send them to the Stanford lab. The Stanford lab would run them on the secret data uh, twice a month, and they would give them back results. Um, one very interesting story to this is that in 2016, Baidu was caught cheating, right? And what was cheating? Cheating was that they made fake accounts in order to try more versions of their system per month. That's it, right? So they make four fake accounts, right? Uh, and tried eight times per month instead of two. That's, that's a bit how sensitive uh, things are to testing again and again. It was, it was a major scandal. I don't know of many scandals like that in academia. Uh, more or less, the actual lab made an announcement that we caught cheaters. Uh, they, they named the lab, uh, the Baidu lab. Uh, the professor leading it ha took a major blow in his reputation. He was quite well renowned. Uh, it was Andrew and G. Uh, he claimed he didn't know that and that, his, uh, uh, and that his lab did it without asking him, like his students did it without asking him. But somehow, it doesn't get more saucier than that in computer science research. Right. Uh, 
Um, so, if we look a bit into the history, uh, although we have a special uh, notion about this, right? Uh, this is Lenet 5. It's practically the first convolutional uh, neural network, a CNN. And, and just to keep things a bit clear, if we if we really need to make a definition of what a CNN is, we could say it's one. It's a network that uses uh, convolutional layers. That's one way of defining it. If that's not, uh, if that's already too cryptic, one might say that it's a network that, uh, at, at least at some parts inside it, propagates things that could be interpreted as images. Right. So somehow, when you have images being propagated uh, while preserving their their geometry, their spatial structure, that would be another way of thinking of what a CNN is. Um, and after Lenet 5, right, Lenet 5 is 1998, it worked on MNIST, it's published along with MNIST, and it had 60,000 numbers. Uh, that's, by today's standard, ridiculously small, but by 1998, uh, it was quite big, right? So somehow, a, a GPU now can train this in one or two minutes to, 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 to a high performance, uh, like a 2000 PC can do that now in one or two minutes, but I think that a 1998 PC would need weeks. Uh, the actual hardware considerations uh, when talking about these things are important. They're not just, uh, you know, something you can totally ignore. Uh, this is the 2012 uh, uh, innovation, right? It's the Alexnet. It's the first uh, it was the first convolutional neural network that successfully proved that it's the best way of dealing with images in general. Somehow, when this came, no one could refute it. Until this network came, people were marginalized for using neural networks in their communities. Right? They were considered eccentrics. One might even say laughed at. Uh, and it took extreme perseverance on their part to somehow maintain that line of research. There was 20 years where funding was never given, if you use the word AI, and even for neural networks, it was very hard to get funding. Uh, if we look a bit into this, and that's a bit to understand that we cannot disentangle the, the practical considerations from it. Uh, essentially, this from Lenet doesn't really have any new ideas. It has a few, a few interesting ones, but, but essentially what this is, is that someone sat down and instead of making it run on the machine like normal programmers would, he went to the extreme effort and made it run in the graphics card manually. And that made it something like a hundred times faster. And then an experiment, instead of needing five years, needed one month. That's a bit the reality of what, of what happened. Right? So, so somehow, in the life cycle of publishing an experiment that takes five years, uh, you can never undertake if there's a high risk of failure, right? Uh, so, so somehow you could maybe have a machine running for one month if you assume that 20%, uh, you know, I might succeed, like I, I give myself 20% at succeeding, but you will never commit for five years giving yourself 20% at succeeding. Uh, so somehow the actual GPU part was what made this different, right? Actual coding was the, the main reason this didn't happen earlier was coding. Uh, it was a, a huge amount of coding with uh, skills that are not broadly known. A very cryptic kind of coding for the GPU. Uh, and the other thing to, to keep a bit in mind is that when this happened, this network could not fit in one GPU. So if you see, the actual drawing of the network has two different heads. And the only reason this happened was because uh, this was too big to fit in even in a single GPU. So somehow, the actual hardware capacity, I think this GPU had two gigabytes. Had it had four, this would be a different shape. right? And the whole method would be different and maybe published differently. Uh, so we were at 60,000 parameters, 
And in 2012, this went to 60 million parameters, right? So one might argue this can learn a thousand times harder things than Lenet if we associate parameters with capacity. And then in 2014, more or less, then it's a bit like going down a slide, different labs uh, began pu you know, publishing and improving on what was existing. Uh, so in 2014 came VGG, and it's just taking the previous one and just making it even bigger. The, the real problem uh, has a lot to do, to do with the practicalities of making it so big. Just that, you know, how, how do I fit it? Uh, and, uh, and it had 138 million parameters, right? There were a few innovative techniques on, on the design of layers, but not that much, right? And then six months later, not even a year, right? Google and Net came, right? And as you can see the trend, the idea is that we're going deeper and deeper. Uh, and that is exactly because the deeper we go, the more abstract things we can learn. Uh, one thing that might be a bit interesting here is that, for example, if we try to go from here and indirectly find the, how much to blame these neurons here, this is practically not doable, right? No matter how we design our networks, when we train it and we're trying to go backward assigning blame, at, at every layer, somehow we're slightly less informed. We're slightly mistaken, even because of uh, numerical, uh, uh, let's say, even because of rounding. Uh, so th this is called the, the problem of the vanishing gradient. It's a standard problem, and it's the reason that it took us so many years to go very deep. Right? Um, so the hack they thought of here was, what if we make a few extra network heads that serve no purpose when we're running, right? So all these parameters serve no other purpose than to somehow bypass all this and give here a meaningful uh, error. And the same thing applies here. So somehow the biggest distance that the error has to travel is this one. This kind of, of hacking is what was needed in order to go deeper. Uh, methodologically, there's still black boxes. It's not like we got deeper insights about how the numbers uh, flow inside this thing. The next step, and somehow that was, one might argue, the last major improvement in classifiers was ResNet, right? Uh, there are variations on top of it, but ResNet is more or less any other one should be considered passe, right? You don't have a reason to not use ResNet uh, and prefer one of the older models, right? Because one of the tricks of ResNet is that it has 23 million parameters. So it's actually smaller in numbers, but it's, they're organized in such a way that it can go extremely deep, down to a thousand layers, right? So, so more or less what they did is that their idea was that if instead of learning uh, to predict the next layer, we should only learn how to change, right? So they just learn to predict what to add to the actual representation of the data they have. They just learn to speak if something should change every layer. And that's how they were capable of going way, way deeper. Right, so the, the whole idea of the ResNet is that these layers here, right, they're added to their, to their input. So the only case where things uh, will change is if these layers decided to change something. Uh, and, uh, and that allowed us to reduce the parameters while still performing way better. Now, Let's take a bit uh, 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 an example once more of this paradigm where choosing is way easier than anything else. If we want to have text images and they're really hard to, to read, we cannot read them, it's way easier, as it proved, to choose from, from a vocabulary. Right? So if we can have a finite vocabulary of, in this case, 80,000 words, more or less 
a very good representation of the English vocabulary. Uh, actually, some of the data used here, among other things, are everything a spell checker is aware of. Right? They took all words a spell checker in English would be aware of, and then added some. Uh, so, so what they did is that they, they, they would more or less normalize images to the height, leaving the width, uh, so, uh, and the width, uh, just propagate convolutionally, have two fully connected layers at the end, right? And then it would give you an opinion on, on the words. Uh, so what, what happens here is that a very long word must be squeezed a lot to fit into 32 by 100, and a very short word must be strained a lot, and yet this works. This works very well, better than any reading system could and probably can. Uh, the other thing that made this paper very influential is that this was one of the first papers that solves a real problem that was trained on pure synthetic data. Right? No one sat down and, and wrote uh, and, uh, and annotated 9 million images that were needed for this. Every word on average occurs 100 times. But what they did is that they just drew every word a hundred times in different ways. They were very, very meticulous on how to express how an image is drawn, how a word is drawn. And then they threw it on real world uh, images and it worked extremely well. Uh, so that's a bit when what we saw until now was the idea of of dealing with uh, images holistically, right? More or less seeing an image and assigning it to a category. Uh, we might want to do the same thing from a stylistic point of view, right? In, in the context of computer vision, that would be texture analysis. A and if we think a bit about it, what is texture? Texture is more or less looking at the small scale, making somehow uh, extracting numbers out of uh, very, very small windows and aggregating all the numbers we extracted to make uh, full conclusions. Uh, if we want to see, think a bit about how would this be done, let's take uh, th this typical thing. And the whole idea would be roughly that we omit all of these. Right? So we, we have the image, we make some more informed representations, and then we just collapse everything average, like say, okay, did you see uh, what in the context of text would be ascenders, descenders, etc.? Did you see the, the specific features that were informative? And then start reasoning over those. So, so somehow, whenever we're dealing with images, uh, th there is this fundamental notion of do I have geometry or not and how much does it matter, right? So somehow texture classification and object classification, the only difference is at which scale do you pull, right? Um, so yeah, these are typical applications uh, of uh, texture analysis, right? We can classify materials. Uh, that could be parchment versus paper and stuff like that, or degradation of parchment. We can identify the script. We can, we can identify the writer. Uh, and uh, it was quite impressive for me. From the same writers, we had an experiment where people contributed um, the, handwriting in different languages, all sharing the same alphabet, right? So we had a writer who wrote in English, German, and French. And we had a system that, without ever being able to see even one letter, right, just by looking at the small detail, could predict the language, right, for, for the same writer. It could say whether something is French or English from the same writer just by looking at the frequencies of stuff happening. Um, so, so this can be quite powerful for many humanities things. Uh, then the next uh, major category of, of, let's say, machine learning uh, 
algorithms or computer vision algorithms we have would be what we call a regression. So until now, both for texture and object detections, we talked about categories, a finite set of categories that somehow will never change from the beginning until the end of, of our work. In this case here, we don't want to say what is something out of categories, but rather how much. That's what we call a, a regression. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is typically way, way harder to do right. Uh, it's also a big problem measuring this, right? You can never compare how well such a thing does compared, uh, to, uh, compared to a classifier. It's apples and oranges. Um, so typical applications of this might be guessing the age from a portrait, guessing yeah, the weather, the, the temperature from an image we see outside. Um, and we could be learning more than one thing. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for example, the, the paper you mentioned uh, quantifying happiness uh, was more or less doing this kind of analysis, right? It was trying to learn how happy does a portrait look in order to come to the conclusion afterwards with a distant reading method or oh, that people were happier are happier now than they were in the past or something like that. Uh, I don't remember the exact citation now. So the moment we say, you know what, we could learn many different numbers that fluctuate independently uh, from, uh, for an image, uh, we go into uh, slightly more creative things once more about text analysis. We go into this uh, PHOC, some people call it FOC, uh, pipeline, where in this case we're saying, okay, given that you cannot exactly read the word, can you maybe predict uh, how letters occur in it? So, so what we do is that we, we take for the whole word image, right? Uh, we take a, a histogram where we have one for the letters occurring, right? So, for example, B, D, E, count would give us this. And, and it's quite hard to see this and reason beyond. But then we can also split it on the first half and get the same representation for the first half and the second, right? And in this case, it already begins to be slightly more informative. How many words begin with any anagram of these letters and end with any anagram of these letters? It's already rarer, right? And then we can break it into three, right? And then we could even break it into five. Uh, and then all these things are, are more or less vectors that we can concatenate. Uh, and, and the thing is that The moment we, we do that, the moment we represent words like that, uh, suddenly we can do regression instead of classification. Suddenly we no longer have 80,000 categories to learn, uh, but rather uh, only 500 numbers, right? Uh, 500 numbers that might be independent one from the other. Uh, and we also have another hack in the methodology, right? Which is that since this is based on the transcription, we can also map strings. We can not only map, uh, let's say, the image of the word, but we can also map the actual word. And, and what we did is more or less that we, we tried to take the actual word, right? And then we took the image of the word hotel and, and we tried to, to bring these two numbers into a common domain, more or less, uh, what we enforced was that I want you to take hotel and bring it near hotel, right? We have a common way of describing things for different domains, strings and images, and we just ask for them to be brought closely. And that's a very creative way of solving a problem that could otherwise not be solved. Uh, at the same time, for example, we could also have a, a sound version, right? We could get the sound pattern of the word, put it here, 
and, and try to learn how to make the sound pattern also end out in the same place as everything else. And then what we would be doing, what we would, uh, what we would effectively have would be something like a, a speech to, to string or even an image to speech. We could have all sorts of relationships, right? So we can take different domains and bring them all together. Uh, that is usually uh, called domain adaptation. Um, keep in mind that this work was not was done uh, before deep learning was uh, dominating. So, so what your methodology bringing you here doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a full neural network end to end. Specifically, what like two years later was the obvious increment, and I, I suspect this is going to be it's already over, right? Uh, for many years, the, the research in deep learning was simply we take something that was working before and now we make a deep network do the same exact thing. We make a deep network out of it and somehow this is way better, right? Actually, it performs better. And that's exactly the story, right? So we had the previous method that was using handcrafted uh, numerical uh, values, averages of things and etc. And now they said, okay, what if we use a network and we just try to learn here the PHOC representation, right? So we have 500 or 600 numbers here and we just try to learn uh, all the way back uh, what should I be looking at at the input image in order to predict correctly whether there was, for example, an A on the first half of the image. Um, and that's that's more or less what we call word spotting uh, as a problem. It's, it's what we do when we cannot read. Uh, for medievalists, for example, it becomes quite important. The, the next deep learning uh, technique we have is uh, specifically metric learning. So, so in metric learning, uh, we don't know where things should end out, but we have pairs of the same domain uh, that we know that they should be close. Uh, this might be a bit, like, we might think a bit of what UMAP does with numbers. Somehow, what we're trying to do in metric learning is that we're trying to bring closely uh, whatever we know should be close, right? Uh, typical uh, applications, Right, is writer identification, face identification, um, more or less the idea is to, to take uh, a classifier uh, and, and use it uh, and make it uh, into a nearest neighbor or a zero shot learning. If we think a bit, uh, a very good example of the kind of problem is this. Uh, uh, for, for, for NGIX, uh, uh, for example, for, uh, for fingerprints. Uh, we cannot know when we're training the actual system and, and we're doing our, our training of the system. We can never have access to the finished database. Every day, new data comes into the database with new identities, etc., etc. So somehow having the idea that I'm going to have a network emit an opinion on who are you out of the, I don't know, 7 billion people on Earth is not a way we can train a network. If we think a bit about this, the only thing that makes sense is that we find, we train a model that could tell us out of a database which one is the most similar. And then someone can manually verify whether that's a match or not. Uh, and that's uh, yeah, a typical metric learning uh, problem. We can do many other things with metric learning, but uh, dealing with identity is kind of a standard one. Right? So in metric learning, the, the, the hack, let's say the idea, was that we will have uh, two neural networks, right? And we will put in data, 
And we will want them to agree. That's the only constraint. Right? These are called Siamese networks because when training, right, they are supposed to agree. In the original formulation of the notion of a Siamese network, uh, the, this was asymmetric, right? This network could be different than this one. They just, you, you just had to learn to agree with another network somehow. Uh, in, in the modern uh, uh, version of it, most people realize quite soon that why don't we share the waves? Why do these networks have to be different? All we want to enforce is that the same network uh, brings these two different samples at the same place. So in one case, we were teaching this one independently and this one independently, but very quickly we went to, to merge these two and say, you know what, we will teach this one to be consistent for these two samples. Right? So somehow we put two samples in, we see the difference, and the bigger the difference, the worse this model is behaving. That's our differentiable Error, uh, error metric. Um, the version where, where they're uh, sharing is called pseudo Siamese, right? Because this one is actually two networks conjoined, the other one is one network used twice. Right? So, typical issues with this might be, for example, signature verification, right? Uh, we would like to have. Uh, a system that can verify signatures without ever having uh, knowing the whole signatures that a man bank might be dealing with, right? Uh, and we just train on a hundred or a thousand pairs of signatures and we say, make it so that whenever these two signatures go in, the output uh, looks alike. Um, now, there are the, one of the things that you should be aware of when choosing a methodology is how hard things are to train. So, for example, classification, we said, is the easiest thing to, to train, right? It's a, it is because there's a lot of people doing it and therefore a lot of resources online, but it's also because of the math. Some formulations are way more, let's say, unstable than others. So if we said that classification is easy and regression is harder than classification, uh, this thing here is extremely harder, right? So uh, this works in theory, but in practice making it work might be very hard. And I'm not talking about coding. It might have to do with curating your data, with balancing things. So, so for example, there were techniques that were needed for these to give us real usable uh, results. We needed, um, we needed hard negative minings, right? So somehow, uh, if I give you two things that are really different uh, and I tell you, put these things apart, that's easy. Uh, somehow, the more I do that, the, the more I end up misleading uh, something that is already behaving slightly decently. Uh, I need to really overemphasize on things that are hard to distinguish and, uh, and more or less focus on training over those. That's a bit what the, we call hard negative mining. We also realized that once more, initially we were just saying bring these things close and ignore how far apart things end out. We realized that this doesn't work as well as giving a negative for a context, right? So the idea now is that we have one thing that is under question. We give you one similar thing to that and one thing definitely dissimilar to that and we ask you to make it so that somehow uh, d differences between the similar things are reduced and differences between the dissimilar are amplified at the same time. Um, if we want to go a bit into a next uh, 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 methodology. Th this would be object detection. Uh, the, the ones we mentioned earlier might be uh, older, but, but object detection now, one might argue, it's the second most established method from the point of view of use cases and popularity. 
after classification. So, so somehow a classifier looks at an image and says what is there. When you do object detection, uh, you're expected to tell me where and what. And you're obviously allowed talking about different things in the same image. Right? That's a, a very good example of that was that we wanted to detect, uh, f um, let's say, elements that are formalized for medieval charters. Right? We have the seals, we have the parchment, we even have the calibration card. So for each one of these, we wanted to, to make uh, a decision on, on where it occurs and what it is. Practically, this is, ends up being one neural network with uh, some regressors, some classifiers for outputs, and, uh, and uh, a very smart, let's say, or complicated strategy for post-processing correction. Right? So, so, so the idea is that we, we, we take the image, we make a grid of things, and we say that in every uh, location in the grid, we can have up to 10 objects or something like that. And then we're saying, okay, uh, regress, uh, take regressions and tell me how much should I widen or close that rectangle and classify at the same time. Tell me what is in that rectangle. So somehow we're trying to learn jointly for multiple hypotheses, uh, what is there, uh, where exactly is it? Should it, is it more to the left, more to the right? And there's also a third uh, thing we're, we're, we're learning, which is also a regression, which is the object objectness, whether that is actually something there or not. Right? So it's a different question what it is. It's a different question whether, where it is. And we're also trying to answer how much do I think it really is there. And, and with this, these different numbers, we then do a, a, a post-processing uh, called non-maximal suppression, uh, and it works extremely good. Uh, okay, so the idea of non-maximal suppression is roughly that uh, for for the same rectangle or very similar rectangles, uh, we cannot have the same class. Somehow, we cannot have a very good overlap between two different classes, so we have to choose. Is this rectangle a seal or is this rectangle a calibration card? If they occur at the same pl place, they must, uh, we must choose. And the criterion for choosing is objectness. That's roughly uh, how it works. Uh, this actually now, even on a normal PC, can work real time. Like we can have a video camera. That's a bit, if, if anyone has seen, uh, how uh, it's the most straightforward way to do real-time tracking of objects on our webcam and things like that. Um, the, the next uh, category of problems that is quite, uh, quite important is what we call segmentation. Uh, and, and one way to, to define it would be to say that segmentation is when we classify every pixel into one of, of, of exclusive categories, right? So every pixel can only be one thing. That's what classification means. We have to choose among categories. We cannot say, oh, you know what? This is a human and a bicycle. No, every pixel is either or. Uh, and somehow the idea is that we map, uh, we, we preserve the whole image geometry, right? So we give an answer that can be totally contextualized to the input, totally mapped to the input. Uh, and uh, the standard way to do that is with a unit, right? So, so the unit encompasses uh, a few ideas about designing your own network. The first one is the idea of an autoencoder. And uh, an autoencoder is highly, was the idea that if I make a neural network as an hourglass and I, and I force it to learn uh, itself, Essentially, at the very narrow level where the activations are very small, what I have learned is a very efficient compression of the image. 
or the data, whatever it may be. It could be for text, it could be for whatever. Right? So an autoencoder as an idea is this hourglass shape. The, the other idea it takes is the idea of the skip-through connections that we saw in resonance. And, and the third idea is this what we call fully convolutional, uh, which means that we never get to see the image uh, globally. Right? If you remember, we have all CNNs and all methods at some point make a, an absolute decision. They get to see all the evidence that concerns them and make an opinion. In a unit, that never happens. Somehow, uh, it, it means that we always make an opinion given uh, a finite context and we can also train on small images but then use on huge ones. Um, so, so when do we want units? We want units when the bounding box from object detection is not enough. If we needed pixel level granularity uh, on the seals, for example, we might need a unit to classify them. It, it's, it's obvious that from the point of view of ground truthing right, and annotating data, it's extremely more work to annotate segmentation data from, uh, from object detection, which is just find a box that, that goes around it. So, for example, uh, a, a good use of UNIT in the humanities was that we had to deal with these papyri. Uh, and, uh, and more or less, the standard binarization methods gave us this. And this is not usable in any way, right? The actual experiment that we were intending to do was uh, uh, scribe identification. Who wrote this papyrus? Are two papyri written from the same person or not? Uh, and, and when we did standard binarization, because that's required in order to do scribe identification, uh, in some pipelines at least, uh, we got this and things wouldn't really work. And then we trained a unit and, and we got this, right? Because somehow, although here it's not very visible, uh, it was trained to even invent things that are missing, right? So, so somehow uh, it, it even learned at some point to, to fill in uh, stuff that, that, that has been missing, like uh, more or less fill in gaps and invent the plausible text. Uh, and that's a bit why deep learning can do things that naive methods cannot, right? Uh, by the way, the technique of, of, of hiding something from the input, but somehow expecting it on the output, uh, is a very powerful way of training data and it's called in-painting. So, specifically, the methodology uh, we used it was also trained on pure synthetic data. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of the problems we have, and that's a standard thing with units, is that how big an image can you fit in your GPU when you're training is quite limited. So people end up taking patches like uh, a quarter of a megapixel or one sixteenth of a megapixel or something like that. Uh, in our case, we use uh, a, 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 a quite useful hack if you're ever limited by memory. We use reversible uh, networks. So that's only applicable when your applications, uh, when your activations is, is your bottleneck. When you, you, when you don't have enough memory to store your activations, you can use reversible uh, networks. It's a relatively new technique. Uh, and suddenly, instead of storing every intermediate computation, you can infer it backwards. You can have, uh, just by more or less uh, seeing the output and the weight, you can infer the input. Uh, and, and by that way, you end up freeing most of your memory activation-wise. And that's what made this uh, training it 
on, on big images. Right? Big images means uh, less biases in the case of uh, segmentation. So the next, the next uh, taxonomy, let's, the next problem in this tax taxonomy is uh, actually instance uh, segmentation. The difference being that in normal segmentation we just want to say chairs right, versus pots and that's a bit what ground truth would look like for segmentation. But in instant segmentation, we want to say one chair, two chairs, three chairs, four chairs. That might look like a trivial change, but, uh, but, but it's a really harder problem. Um, so we have data sets that are quite big for this. They're probably the hardest data sets to ever make. They might be more labor intensive than ImageNet, even if they have a hundred times less samples. Uh, these are MS Coco, which expresses uh, things here as contours. Uh, and we have Pascal VOC, which expresses stuff uh, as, uh, as actual pixels. You can go from one to the other, but it's not exactly the same. Um, so when we're talking about instant segmentation, the, the most uh, standard method, let's say the, what you would say off-the-shelf method, is probably master CNN. There might be slightly more recent methods now, but somehow um, this has been the state of the art for quite a while, was the state of the art for quite a while. Uh, and uh, in, in this case, uh, wh what you're doing is that you're, you're learning a, a rich representation of the image and at some point, you're trying to, to learn something that creates a list of hypotheses. As opposed to YOLO, uh, in, in YOLO more or less, you have a fixed amount of hypotheses and you're just expected to say where they occur. Somehow look for things in this region. While here, you're, you're actually constructing an explicit list. Uh, this performs uh, better than YOLO. Uh, it's but it is much harder to train. It's extremely more uh, computationally demanding. And it's also much harder to, uh, to do inference, to use. One, one last thing you should keep in mind is that whenever, as in this case, you're forced to go out of the network and back in, that means extremely complicated and ugly and fragile engineering. Uh, Having what they call end-to-end -end learning, somehow putting an error here and getting an output here, uh, might be computationally very expensive, but from the point of view of how complicated it is to handle, it's way simpler. Uh, whenever you have things like loops or anything like that, it becomes complicated. So. The other thing that is quite fundamental, even if we're talking about images, is sequences, right? Uh, in our case, we care about sequences. The easiest way to say images care about sequences would be probably thinking of something like uh, uh, HCR or OCR, but this is a very good taxonomy of how can we deal with sequences, right? So in this framework, we can consider that a normal CNN is just a sequence of one. Right, an image goes in, uh, a classification comes out. That could be viewed as a, as a synthesis. Now, when we have one image going in and a sequence of stuff coming out that's generated, uh, let's say, uh, on the fly, uh, a typical use case for this would be captioning. Right, in this case, we see one image, we see it holistically, we see all of it, and we try to make a sequence of words. Uh, the typical use case would be image captioning, but there can be many others. There can be the opposite, image generation. Right? You want to describe uh, an image, and somehow you want the model to draw it for you. The par th this paradigm is this one, right? where we have a sequence of words, because order matters, and we end up generating one image. Right? We could have many to many. And a good way to, to describe this uh, 
in the context of images would be video generation. Right? So we describe the video scene and we get a sequence of frames at the output. Um, an easier thing would be in other domains such as translation. This would be a translator, right? More or less. We have one sequence here. It's all compressed to a single representation and then all unfolded again in the output. And here, what we have is many to many. Now, as we see, there is a, these two appear to be, from the point of view of inputs and outputs, equivalent. But the difference is that here we have a single bottleneck. We try to learn a summary of the whole thing. While here, we don't. Uh, the typical use for this would be, for example, HCR or OCR. Or, and, and essentially, transducers also do the same thing. Right? So in this case, uh, there is never one activation that can talk about the whole data. Uh, and the benefit of this is that we can go on computing uh, while the whole sample we're dealing with is too big to fit in any conceivable way in memory. So when we have sequences, uh, LSTMs or RNNs are kind of standard. Uh, or, have, or to be more exact, were standard. Uh, nowadays, they're being surpassed. But, but, but the idea here was that we had an input at different time steps. Uh, when we say time, that could also be space, right? If we're thinking of HCR, what we call time could be left to right. Uh, and we have a box that for every moment in time will emit one opinion but also have an internal state which it, it passes on to the next one. So somehow, uh, as we're piece by piece looking at the letter A, uh, this is propagated through the internal state until eventually we decide, oh, we saw the letter A. That's roughly uh, the idea. Uh, these ended out uh, finalizing to an architecture like this one, which is quite more complicated, right? We, we have more or less two things, right? We have the output, but we also have the internal state. Uh, and we have uh, a bandwidth, more or less, that can go way, way back, right? So somehow uh, this architecture was needed in order to train any RNN productively. RNNs were first conceived uh, 30 years ago and for 20 years, no one could make them work. Because of this whole notion of sending the gradient back, in this case, the errors are every time uh, exponentiated, right? So if an error here is one, if our uncertainty here is one, here it's 10, here it's 100, it explodes or collapses, right? If something is smaller than one, it will end up being zero. And if something is bigger than one, it will end up being infinite very quickly. Um, so, uh, so how exactly can we do uh, HCR or OCR? Uh, it might seem a bit uh, trivial, but uh, somehow there's a major problem uh, between uh, the image and the actual uh, transcription. Um, so. Or for, in, in this case, uh, for speech, right? Whether we're talking about a, an image or a sound wave, somehow they're totally equivalent. It's numbers over time. But the difference is that we don't know how much space is needed for everything. Some things are very short, other things are longer. Some things have big gaps, other things have small gaps. And as we said earlier, when we're doing this kind of work, no one ever sees the whole sentence, let's say, at once. You need to be forming an opinion as the data comes in, because practically because you cannot feel the whole sentence. Uh, and so in order to do that, we had to somehow learn how to interpret with many, with an infinity of alternative interpretations, what came out and decide whether it's right or wrong, right? So the problem here was that we have all sorts of interpreting the outputs because 
we have one output for every column, let's say, or for, for every millisecond if it's speech. But somehow uh, we have here 2,000 milliseconds, a sequence of 2,000 milliseconds, and we want to have seven symbols out. It, when, when that's our predicament, we need to somehow decide when did I have a symbol and when not. This is done with these uh, epsilon, more or less, uh, emissions. So we invented, we allowed networks to say, I don't know, I'll speak later. And make the I don't know as something equivalent to I do know. And then we, we said, okay, now tell me all, out of all the possible interpretations of the 2000 outputs, which one is the best one fitting the, the output and find who's to blame for that not being good enough. Conceptually, it's quite hard uh, to grasp, uh, but practically what we should keep in mind is that training these things uh, is very complicated. The only reason that it's quite easy and we can do it with transcribus and other tools is because of the infinity of man hours having fallen on them. Uh, the moment we want to go off script, we're in very quickly in very deep water. Uh, whenever we're dealing with such data. So somehow, such data to a great extent, such uh, models, we need, we're better advised to use as a black box or somehow take something that works and just use it. Uh, there's major risk involved, uh, risk from the point of view of succeeding or not uh, in, in saying, I'll do it myself. Um, So, so in the same taxonomy of problems nowadays, we have transformers dominating, right? Uh, RNNs, which is this idea of a feedback, were dominating uh, until four years ago or so. Um, and then transformers came to be, and, and, and roughly the idea about transformers is that they considered uh, all distances to be equal. They just expressed location in some way. For example, position of the pixel uh, in the uh, position of the pixel in the in the whole image. But uh, essentially, every datum in a transformer, every element of information, is no longer arranged with a, a special thing, we cannot say something is here or there. They're treated as a soup of things, just describing for every datum. You know what, these two numbers, we have a hundred numbers telling you what you are, and two numbers or three numbers or one number telling you where you are. And everything learns to interact with everything. Uh, transformers are more or less what, what guides uh, GPT, uh, chat GPT. Uh, and through this mechanism, through learning how to find on the fly what should be related to what, they have managed to do high-level reasoning, right? So until now, more or less, the only thing you could do is take a number and make it smaller or bigger. And that was the nature of what these deep learning methods could do. Uh, with uh, transformers, we, we have gone a step beyond that. And it's, it's very hard to demonstrate on, on, on toy examples, on small examples, right? For, for transformers to convince people that there is some reasoning uh, happening, they needed to go on the petabytes of the train data or whatever. Um, right, so, yeah, this is a typical uh, captioning pipeline, right? We have, this is specifically, uh, what was the state of the art in 2015? Um, so the idea was that we had a whole Google net uh, describing an image, and then we would plug in these images into the state of the RNN, a bit as it, on, on where things from previous time steps go. So we would say, this is your setting, 
and now start producing text. One, one thing that is quite interesting about this image captioning uh, data is that somehow all of the engineering has to go here in producing the text. Understanding the image is way simpler and more straightforward. That, that, that is a rather interesting uh, approach. The, the reason why this was so hard was because, uh, more or less, it was harder to speak English than to see what's in the image. Right? If you find, uh, if you find uh, a hat uh, and uh, some lettuces and some uh, bags and lots of people, and you say, take all these things and put them in a sentence. The most easy sentence to generate is a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. Right? So somehow, uh, if you just have a few nouns, because essentially that's what these things are learning and detecting. If you have a few nouns and you ask a language model to put them in a narrative, what comes out? will probably be the right thing. That's a bit my understanding of how these methods work. And that's exactly why this is more definitive to what comes out than this. Right? This more or less suggests nouns or noun phrases and describes them as numbers. And then we have something that needs to stitch them into a narrative. Uh, and the narrative part is the hardest one. Uh, when these uh, captioning things happened, in order for this to work, looking exactly holistically at the image was not enough. Right. We also needed to, to develop what we call uh, attention. Right. So somehow, whenever you, you spoke a word on the generating side, uh, you would be better off focusing in the image uh, where you put emphasis. You would just say, you know what? Some pixels uh, are more important than others. And if we, if we that, that's a very interesting visualization here. We can plot whenever it's saying a word, right? So just a bit to understand, we have a neural network, right? The RNN producing a narrative. And at every moment, whenever it's saying a word, it decides somehow how much is the input image, how much are regions of the input image uh, relevant to the specific word in the narrative, right? So we have two kinds of attention. If we see we have the soft attention here, which more or less says yes or no over the whole image, and the hard attention, which has to only choose one spot in the image, right? Hard attention is nowadays not used that much. It's also harder to train because it's not differential. Uh, but soft attention is, uh, is by far uh, the easiest thing uh, to train and quite informative, right? Uh, what's interesting here is water, right? Water is deduced from this, while bird is very clearly deduced from that. And, uh, and somehow the, the over has a bit of both, right? Uh, so. Uh, sequence to image is the, the next uh, taxonomy, uh, like the next method in this taxonomy we should be looking into. And, uh, and it's quite more recent than the rest of the, of the methods. Uh, it's also quite uh, more demanding computationally. Uh, but uh, if we look a bit in a very abstract way, Right? We might say that we're kind of doing the opposite. Right? So we're having a sequence analysis thing. It ends up having a specific representation of the whole sentence or sequence of things you gave. And then it tries to go from a few numbers to whole image, more or less having a network that is uh, a classifier flipped upside down. Uh, that's roughly how this uh, kind of uh, method works, right? Uh, results uh, are spectacular. Uh, style transferred 
uh, is uh, is very easy, but also it could create deep fakes. Well, in general, we have many generative models, and they can create deep fakes. And there are serious ethical considerations. Uh, deep fakes are not only about misinformation, which is one side. It's also about exploiting cognitive biases. Humans are way weaker at exercising judgment over image than judgment over speech. Uh, so, so somehow, uh, whenever you can create images, it seems that people tend to believe them more. A very easy way we, we all understand that occurring would be memes, right? Memes are way stronger than tweets uh, in, in perception capability. The reason being that it's harder when you see an image to exercise uh, judgment. Um, so, so whenever we have image generation, right, uh, in general, uh, we, regardless of whether a sequence or something else was what uh, prompted the thing, let's assume it's just about generating images. We go off the sequence, let's say taxonomy. Um, we have uh, several questions. One is adversarial samples. That's a very interesting line of research. Is somehow making images that can mislead neural networks. Uh, a lot of work has been done there, and it's uh, it's uh, spectacular, right? So one of the, I think this was on uh, VGG, like the earlier network we saw from 2014. Uh, so if we show this image, right? In in the, this is from ImageNet. We sh we show this image, uh, and the model we say with a 57.7 percent confidence. This is a panda, right? Now, we can create such an image that if we multiply it by less than 1%, right? Something that the eye can never ever perceive, a 1% difference at the luminance for every pixel, right? We can create such an image such that when we add it on that, we get this image, right? To, to the human eyes, these two images look totally indistinguishable. But this one is classified as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. Right? So, so somehow, very, very small perturbations can exploit biases in neural networks. That's very interesting because until now we have only discussed about how these things are always right. It's very important to be aware of how easily can they be fooled. Uh, so, so somehow, that here is the, re the, the reason why uh, using security applications for, uh, of computer vision is extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, if we go a bit into adversarial samples. The previous one was mathematically derived. We took every pixel and made it the best value it can ever be, so that with a very small perturbation, uh, it fools the network. But uh, someone else decided to make a different uh, st story, more or less. And they, they, they experimented with uh, small programs that just draw things, right? Like with drawing instructions. And they ended out, uh, they used evolution over that to, to choose, uh, let's say, uh, drawings generated out of nothing that can fool the networks. That gives us slightly more intuitions on, on, on what kind of stuff networks are looking into. Right? So, for example, this here is a king penguin. This is a starfish. This is a baseball. Right? This is a guitar. All these things were drawings that were slightly learned uh, through trial and error without ever having any of this gradient, like how to correct themselves. Just trial and error a lot of times in order to fool the networks. Um, the, the interesting thing about this paper specifically, right? they came with all these things here. Right? They, they even did it for MNIST. Okay, so 
all these things are classified as zeros. Right? If we want to go a bit deeper into how easily can they be fooled. Right? According, we get a 99.8% accuracy from, from networks like Lanet now, kind of superhuman performance, but still, if you give them this, they will think that's a zero. And if you give them that, they will think that's a five. They're going to be pretty sure about it also. Right, so, so in this story, another thing that was way ahead of its curve, right, nowadays it's very common, is that they took all these samples here, right, specifically these ones that were more or less drawings that were evolved, drawing, uh, let's call them narratives, right, more or less uh, a sequence of instructions on how to draw something, totally unconstrained, right. They, they took this and they participated in a competitive art exhibit. Uh, if I remember correctly, without ever saying this is AI. Uh, and they won first prize. Right, so that's 2015. As far as I understand, it's the, probably the first time that purely AI generated stuff uh, produced things that, according to experts, had to be acknowledged as art. Uh, Style transfer is another thing when we think a bit of generating images. And, and, and the first paper that showed spectacular results in this was, was this one. This one actually is, is quite creative uh, um, because it's not actually training a model uh, to, to, to emit something that looks like something. It's actually just using a model and its, uh, and its opinion of things uh, to, to generate an image. So somehow what we're actually doing here is that we're taking uh, a model and we're, we're really abusing it, let's say, um, in order to, 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 uh, to generate. So nowadays there are style transfer methods that are neural networks a bit like a, a unit or an encoder or, uh, or, or that, that, that do it differently. But this one was the first thing and the, the hack it was more or less doing. It was saying take this uh, simple image classifier uh, and uh, I would like you to more or less see the same thing between this uh, random image uh, and uh, and this image here at a, at a given scale. So somehow uh, this is very interesting uh, because uh, it's, it proves almost mathematically that what we consider style, it's a matter of scale, right? All, all, all it says, it's more or less, uh, I want images that will differ uh, on, on the early layers, but be similar on the late uh, layers and just take a neural network and, and, and do the same thing you would use for training but instead of, of actually training layers in the network you have to train the input image right so, so the idea here is that take this neural network see what the opinion is for, the, for, for this image and then force the style uh, backwards, right? So one of the things that came out is that while this was very good for, for uh, stylistic things such as Van Gogh or other painters, if we use this for photography, we, we see that already uh, images are not consistent, right? Somehow uh, there's a uh, the sunrise is transferred, although it doesn't make sense. Uh, that, that's, that, that, that's a bit interesting to understand a bit the limitations of CNNs when they're used in a crude manner, right? When they're used in a, in a crude manner, they will just try to imitate at the smallest level. So what looks spectacular in this case, right, taking this image and this, looks quite naive uh, 
when we do it on real world images. Now, uh, when we think of image generation, one of the most uh, important frameworks is what we call generative adversarial networks, GANs. Right? So, so GANs, in GANs the idea is that we only know what's real. We don't have initially any class or data. We just have images and we want to produce images that look as if they are plausible. Uh, and we said, okay, if we don't have ground truth, what could we do? And someone thought that we can maybe force them to learn how to mimic data. Right? The, the idea being that we're going to have uh, we're going to have more or less um, one neural network trying to see whether a sample is real or fake and another neural network trying to produce a fake sample and at every given time uh, how, how much was so the loss for the generator uh, is how much how good was the discriminator right so we have one model that discriminates between a real and a fake sample we have another model that produces the fake sample uh, and uh, and the idea is that they fight it out, right? Uh, this was actually mathematically formulated as finding the Nash equilibrium, which is more or less uh, where, where to, for it's, it comes from game theory and it would be roughly where, where two things can converge such that they're kind of stable, right? So when, when you have two things fighting, uh, according to game theory, they converge to specific values, that's the Nash equilibrium. Um, so, uh, initially, right, they were working pretty, pretty weakly, right? We had to start with 30 by 30 pixels. And somehow, this is a good uh, thing of, of evolution, right? This is hundreds of papers later, right? And, and probably millions of man hours attacking the problem of image generation. But we can see that in 2014, when the, the, the idea first came up, we were there, right? And already by 2017, we ended up being here, right? So, so somehow, uh, the, what you should keep from this is that, be careful, whenever you say it doesn't work, you might simply be there, right? Now, there's a bit of a question, how many man hours are needed to go all the way here. But the fact that something doesn't work doesn't mean that it cannot work at all. Right? It might simply mean that it needs a lot of work on tweaking. Uh, whether it's worth investing that work, it's always an open question. Uh, nowadays, I think we're here, right? And if I'm not mistaken, there's no human that could distinguish between this and a real image, right? So the next thing was, okay, we have this thing that just generates plausible images, but could we maybe control what's being generated? And that's a bit uh, where we are, let's say, where we were two years ago or three years ago uh, from the point of view of that, right? So we more or less could give uh, images to, to prime things and we could somehow blend their features at a very high level, right? So I, I'm not sure if this is convincing to you, but, but the idea that, that this face is the average of these two, to me seems uh, spectacular and we can see that it learns very, very high level features, right? Um, now, the, the GANs are something to never forget because a discriminative loss, the idea of uh, fooling, uh, of trying to fool a network and teaching it whether it can discriminate fake or real data and use that network as the ground truth for training, that can occur whenever you're missing ground truth. Right, so somehow 
if we're thinking a bit abstractly of, of strategies you could employ, uh, plausibility. Uh, when, whenever you, you think that plausibility of a datum might be enough uh, to train your problem, you might be able to get away without any real data for supervision. That's a major, uh, a major hack that can really allow you to do uh, new things. Uh, as we talked very quickly earlier, we have this idea of autoencoders. It has been around for decades, right? And the idea is that we have this hourglass shape, more or less a vector here, numbers here, right? It doesn't have to be an image or anything. It could be an image. And it gets narrower and narrower, and we learn networks that do that. Initially, the most useful thing about this was that it was learning good compression. If I can reconstruct the output here so that it's exactly the input, it means that instead of a thousand numbers, I can use 700 numbers to describe it. That's essentially what information compression is. And these things, for example, are very easy. The application of this would be to make a very, very powerful uh, image compressor. It could be 100 megabytes, part of uh, Chrome or Firefox or whatever. And maybe it could allow us to reduce all the images we're seeing daily uh, by two orders of magnitude or something. Um, the other fundamental idea that we had in autoencoders, which is now used in, once more in many ways, is the idea of self-supervision. This thing here doesn't need any ground with one once more, right? We can take the input and, and consider it the output. Now, Trivial things we can do in order to make, uh, to make it slightly smarter is what if we start erasing things from the input and still ask it to invent them, right? That's a very simple way to force this representation to be as informed as possible. And, and in that idea, more or less, we had what's called variational on toy coders. And this is a bit what they look like in MNIST. So normally, uh, a simple autoencoder, if you change anything here, even slightly, it might have catastrophic results on the, on the output. Right? If you go here and you change just you know, one number by 3%, uh, the output might become something totally different. You cannot control uh, the effect that changes have at the very, very dense representation. But uh, with a very, very uh, smart and, and quite complicated mathematically trick, if you force your bottleneck to be able to work for random noise uh, with some statistical properties, uh, essentially you can force your network to learn very high level representations, right? So this was trained to have an image and predict an image, but yet, as we see, right, these are two different numbers we're tweaking in the in the in the bottleneck layer, right? But somehow, it learns to somehow uh, it learns a notion of uh, of let's say eightness versus nineness or sevenness versus oneness, right? So we see that somehow we can use this thing to learn manipulable uh, representations. Uh, in, in, this is one more way of doing image generation that is quite realistic nowadays. So, so in this case, more or less, the way that they manage to go from this, which is quite naive, is that, of course, a lot of specific engineering, but also the idea that instead of learning uh, a bottleneck, the bottleneck is more or less referring to a big index, and we're learning the index as well. Uh, and this allows us to go from this to this. Right. Uh, so, so somehow, the moment we can go from this to this, but summarize it in, for example, 100 numbers, it means that we have learned how to describe all these pictures with a hundred numbers.
somehow that's a very good quantification of how much our model knows. Uh, that, that will be all for, for this lecture. <laughs>